Well, this listening lab is going to be different than normal. I'm, as you can see, not in my studio, not even in a hotel. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona right now. It's 94 or five degrees. I'm trying to get this done before sound check. So I'm out on the road with Snarky Puppy. We're opening for Steely Dan and actually Steely Dan is gonna be sound checking right there pretty soon. So I'm trying to get this done beforehand. It's always a bit of a, a battle each day trying to find a spot either in the arena or in these outdoor amphitheaters where it's it's quiet and you're not gonna disturb anybody. It's my uh, warm up spot for today here. Steely Dan just started sound checking and uh, hoping I won't be bothering anybody. You know, warm up and not bug anybody. I was on the tour bus this morning trying to work on stuff. But then somebody came on and was trying to sleep, so I've been wandering around outside. So this month we're gonna be focusing on There Will Never Be Another You is the tune and focus in the virtual studio and specifically this exquisite Stan Getz performance from an album called The Steamer. I'm literally gonna be playing this from my laptop. So, you know, forgive the sound quality, but you can obviously hear this for yourself uh, in much better sound quality wherever you choose to listen to music. This is just about pointing out some some high or highlighting some moments in the solo for if you're gonna transcribe any part of this for our transcription challenge or just for listening to it and observing this stuff. One of the big things that I love about Stan's playing is the way that he interprets melodies. And so if you know this standard, or if you don't, I hope you'll take this opportunity to learn it. But if you look up a lead sheet for it, it's pretty straightforward. Quarter notes, half notes, quarter dotted quarter notes, maybe it gets to an eighth note here and there. But these standards, one of the cool things about them, this is a total tangent, by the way, but I've heard this story multiple times that back in the Tin Pan Alley days of songwriting, 30s and 40s in New York City, in the Brill Building when composers like Jimmy Van Heusen and you know all the others were turning out songs. Jimmy Van Heusen, side note, in 1940, he published 60 songs. In 1940, six zero songs published, recorded on the radio. Mind blowing. But the biggest source of, of revenue for the music industry apparently back then was the sale of sheet music. And henceforth, the standards that you see, the lead sheets that we look at in real books and fake books and such, you know, when you see there will never be another you on paper, it looks like do, 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 do. Nobody plays it that way, right? Everybody interprets it. But the simpler they could make the sheet music, the more sheet music they would sell. So capitalism led to the standards being simplified, which led to many upon many iterations and interpretations. And without further ado, let's check out the maestro Stan Getz here. First of all, that beautiful intro, but let's just listen to the first place that he phrases the melody. Right, uh, it's gonna be a little hard for me to do this rewinding. This may not work after all. This is not gonna work. I can hear Donald's on stage right now checking, so to be continued. again but the air conditioning are, are units are so loud and there's no every room is filled up inside the venue so we're gonna have to make do with this <laughs> First of all, the way he sets up the time there, beautiful. And I think one of the main things I would point out that's, that I like here is just the way he embellishes parts of the melody. Um, and there's like these subtle kind of bluesy elements. Um, there's chromatic elements. I mean, I hate to put too many labels on it. Really, it's just listen to it and, and find the parts that kind of make you go, ooh. But there. How subtle that is. It's not. It's. You almost don't hear those notes in between. Mm. 
really nice job of catching that half step two five there. So as the changes turn around, it's, the form is A, B, A, C. And as we get to the end of the B section, instead of just a two measure two five one back to E flat major, instead of F minor seven for a measure, B flat seven for a measure, you get a measure of F sharp minor, B seven, F minor, B flat seven, and you hear him nail that. Also the way he kind of uses um, the sound of, uh, well, I'll speak in concert, B minor major seven or B minor major seven nine, B minor nine major seven over the B flat seven to kind of get that altered sound. I went back. Right there, the way he um, enunciates the time, this is a perfect example of a, of a kind of a gets thing. Listen to this, the way he accents this top note. Right there. Coming up. Right there. <laughs> Right there, that phrase. Nice little melodic connection. That line right there, just go back and listen to the, the time feel there. Beautiful. I just love that. Lydian action there. He's kind of doing a triad pairing. So over the E flat major, he's doing F major, like an F major triad, an E flat major triad sound to kind of give you the sound of the Lydian, the sharp 11 there. Really highlight that concert A natural. Right here, I'll, I went back. Right here. By the way, this is 1957. I want to say Leroy Vinegar on bass, Stan Levy on piano, Lou Levy on drums. 1957, recorded like November 1957 in Hollywood. So I just point that out because even that like sort of triad pair Lydian thing, it's like a little bit ahead of the curve for that moment. <laughs> All these sort of long flowing eighth note lines, they're really great illustrations of classic sort of stet, stets. Stan gets his time feel. The way he moves his fingers is really what's delivering that time feel. 
uh, I mean, the articulation's part of it, but the fingers are so clean and there's such a bounce to it. I love that phrase right here, this little kind of this thing right here. Right here. Whatever, he, you know what I mean, that. Kind of a classic. But there he takes that, what could be like a delivered is kind of a technical exercise, right? You're just encapsulating this, the major scale there. But the way he does it rhythmically and melodically is what kind of brings it alive. Listen again. That little boo doo da doo doo da da doo da boo doo da kind of like again I'm I'm really applying labels after the fact just to illustrate it, but you kind of have this a rhythmic motif boo doo da boo doo da doo doo da doo doo da. So something you can think about when you're when you're practicing is like hey how can I like go through a whole chorus of the song and maybe take a rhythm like that boo doo da doo doo da doo doo da. Just use that as your as you're kind of scaffolding to improvise with, you're obviously changing the notes, but thinking, hey, I'm going to use that rhythm. Oh. So there's that phrase again. So the first time he did it kind of elongated and sort of made it more melodic. But here it shows up again a little bit more on the nose. There again. A little melodic fragments that he's reusing. What that does is kind of just helps break it up so it's not all just right? He kind of balances out that more through composed nature of the solo with these places where he'll he'll re you know he'll restate a small melodic fragment like that just kind of helps connect the the dots connect connect the information <laughs> Great solo by um, Stan Levy too, and they trade at the end. But just in the interest of time, I will leave you with that. And um, also, it's getting really hot on the bus. So I hope, goodness, I hope this came through enough to hear it again. My apologies for the crappy audio and such, just playing this out of the laptop and onto the phone. But again, you can look up the song so you can hear it at good quality, great quality. And I just wanted to point some of this stuff out and. Um, yeah, there it is. What a great soul. If you're doing this in the transcription challenge in the studio, you know, just I'll, I'll put the, the different options below, but use this example as a great way to shed the melody of this song. And, and you know, I, I always think it's a good idea to, you know, to have a balance of like, maybe you learn it from the lead sheet and a, and a soloist or two. So you kind of know what the embellishments are versus what the actual melody, you know, the actual composition is, but you could do a lot worse than learning how to play. There'll never be another you from Stan Getz.